Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to another edition of Syracuse Sports, presented by Krause Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for SU Athletics. Brent Axe, Emily Liker, back at it here. Day three of Syracuse football spring practice in the books, our second podcast on spring football. We've got plenty to come, a little recruiting report, including a very, very big recruit, quite literally, that Syracuse got a commitment from over the weekend. You're going to hear from Coach Fran Brown, both coordinators today, Jeff Nixon and Elijah Robinson, who we had the opportunity to catch up with in the past couple of days. One of the, the big incoming receivers for Syracuse, Jackson Meeks. You're going to hear from them coming up, some impressions from some players that we got to talk to today as well. And perhaps we go to the voicemail and go to the bullpen for our friend from Florida. Stay tuned for that. Emily, uh, we are out there today, and uh, we had a little mix of inside and outside football. The sun was shining in central New York. Uh, still a little brisk out there, certainly, but it was interesting to see the philosophy and the mix of back and forth. We saw a little scuffle at practice today. Dan Villari and Chase Simmons got into it a little bit. They got kind of shoved into a snowbank. So, hey, we're in full pads. The juices are flowing and really kind of football. Fell. That's spring football. There we go. In, in the snow. Exactly. Yeah, in right. the snow. What what were your takeaways from our, our observations of practice today? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're still in the early, early phase of spring practice here. Like you said, this is just the first day that they've got pads on. Um, in terms of what we're viewing as media, it's still kind of like seven minutes of stretching and then assorted drills. Like we really haven't seen any any true scrimmage work or like goal line period or any of that stuff um but there's definitely some things starting to take shape i i was over watching the o-linemen for kind of the first time today and and they got called out like oh he one's come up to the front so like that'll probably be in my my notebook at the end of the week about what that group is looking like and and who's going to start there it's it's who you expect it's it's Cruz, it's john ray reed it's joe moore um and then taking a look at who's behind those guys and maybe fighting to to replace them um but yeah, you know, I, I think just the intensity ramped up that that buzz we talked about on last week's podcast is is still there. And I think um, is, is translating a little bit more to to the field and to what's actually going on. As, as like you said, we saw um, just some some friendly competition at practice today. <laughs> noticeably quieter day uh, at, at practice today. Saturday was like Woodstock with all the recruits that were there and their families. And it's a Saturday, of course. And I think that's the only Saturday we're going to get to see through the course right. of practice. There's a couple scrimmages coming and everything, but there actually were some recruits there today that were on spring break and taking things in. And you're going to hear a clip from Fran Brown about recruiting coming up here in a moment, but I've noticed those recruits, they're right out there. Like they are in the drills they are out there. Fran was saying, and you'll hear it in the clip about, we want to show them who we are, how we recruit you is how we're going to coach you. And it was interesting to see that. But Emily, one thing, and I know maybe this is cliche in a way, but it, in this case, it's really popping. And you asked Coach Brown about this today. This team is just noticeably bigger. Not only the new players that they've brought in, and we're going to go over a couple of guys that impressed us uh, on the new front, if you will, coming up here shortly, but LaQuinn Allen has put on about 10 to 15 pounds of muscle. The new players that are in that are bigger and stronger, and there's just a real emphasis on that, and this is certainly by look test. One of the more mm -hmm. impressive teams that I think Syracuse has put together in recent years. We'll see how that continues to develop here, and you brought up a good point. Like We have about 20 minutes or so at practice the first five or six minutes of that it's just stretching so that's what i'm looking for during stretching like how big are these guys who pops mm -hmm. in that and then we kind of have to prioritize what we want to view what we want to look at i'm taking some videos at practice as well it's it's a scramble right so you really have to kind of prioritize what you want to do but the three days and the three practices that we have to observe and Fran talked about it with you, Emily, this team, it, they are bigger. And it's not just the new guys. It's, it's some of the returning players as well. Right. I mean, LaQuint's a guy that we had talked about last week getting bigger. And we talked to him today um, and heard from, from Brown and Nixon about LaQuint's size. Uh, I believe it was Nixon who, who really described him as like, he, he should be like a 210, 212 pound back. He's currently around 205, 206, I think. But um, I mean, like just physically, like, I, I don't even know that these guys are necessarily like putting on that much weight, but it's the way the weight is manifesting on their bodies. Like they just look so much bigger and stronger. But one thing that stood out about what Brown said was that 
you can be big, but you have to be tough too. And there, yeah. it's it, you're not just automatically good at football because because you're a big dude, right? And so that'll be interesting to see, kind of like, okay, this person's big, but are they also good at football? Which I know there's at least one person we're going to talk about today who is big and does seem to be good at football in that running back room besides the Quint. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's what we were expecting. We talked to the strength staff last week and, and discussed that a little bit on the pod. Those guys worked worked their butts off with the team over over break and uh, through the off season. And, and, you know, they've got a new diet program in there. We've seen them every single day out. They get to come out. They have their little smoothies. They look so delicious as we're standing there <laughs> uh, waiting and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, you know, this is this is a big team. But as Brown kind of said, Big is just the first step to a successful team. Speaking of big, so over the weekend, if you guys didn't catch this to divert to a little recruiting here, Byron Washington, who was one of several recruits that visited, and we have seen an uptick here in the 48 hours since Saturday of several players that have verbally committed to the class of 2025 for Syracuse. So you may remember the name Byron Washington. Certainly if you see the photo of Byron Washington, it's going to stand out. Six foot eight, 380 pound offensive lineman from Texas. He went viral a couple months ago, Emily. There was a Texas uh, state championship game and Byron Washington was just manhandling a poor player on the other team. And you see that photo pop up and you're like, oh man, that's AI or that's Photoshop. Like right. that can't be real. But it is a real photo. Somebody asked me from one of our Syracuse Sports Insiders, is this the biggest recruit Syracuse has ever brought in? I don't think the answer is yes, but I'd be stunned if he was outside the top five in that department. So speaking of big, they're going after some really big players here. And it's incredible that a, a human being who is 17, 18 years old can be that big, but comes up from Texas and Syracuse gets these commitments, Emily. We've seen a few roll in after these these big recruiting weekends. And we'll play, the, you know, let's play it now. Fran, you know, was talking about recruiting and what his philosophy is there. And I thought he had an interesting take on that. Let's let's play that. Just have fun. Come see what we do. Uh, we won't hide anything. You get a chance to see everything up front. I mean, it was supposed to be a but He had a bunch of guys committing. It was snowing. You know, they talked to him about going there in the cold. Don't go up no air in the cold. It's going to be cold. They're going to try to get there in the summer. We don't want to hide anything. We know it was snow that weekend. We still had guys come in. Come see what it's like to be in the snow. And you realize it's not as cold as people tried to say it was. I mean, it's a cool spot. We play inside anyway. Still get a chance to be outside. I mean, you'll see guys from... Florida, Texas, all over the place out there, diving in the snow, having fun. I mean, when you're that, when you're that, when you're my age, you don't like the snow. When you're that age, it's pretty fun. You know, it's cool. So I mean, it's just pretty cool. You know, it's excited. My my approach to recruiting, same thing I told you from the beginning. It's just how we recruit you. It's how we gonna coach you. How you see me coach out here. It's the way we recruit. So same. Thing. There you go. That's Fran Brown uh, and the guys having a little fun in the snow. And yes, yeah, Saturday was a, a late. Winter, early spring snowstorm in central New York. Didn't matter. Everybody seemed to have a good time, and, and he's landed some commits as a result uh, since then. Not of the snow, but of that day and what all these recruits have been saying about since their visit to Syracuse on Saturday. Right. I was going to say, one, my recruiting visit for Syracuse.com was a snowy weekend, and I still committed, <laughs> despite the fact that I got up here and I was like, oh my gosh, why is it snowing in late March? And everyone was like, this doesn't happen that often. And I was like, I don't know that I believe you, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, like, we stood there and watched on, on Saturday morning in the lobby of Ensley as all of these people kept coming in. And there, there were so many dudes that were just like full heads above everyone else in the room and then you look in there with their families and their dad is also like six foot three, six foot four. And you think these are 17 year old kids. Some of them are done growing, but not all of them. There are going to be kids that put on another couple inches by the time they get there, which is, which is partially right. I always think it's funny how much we care about kids height and weight when they're in recruiting, because it's like, this is an 18 year old boy. Like they're, he is going to grow by the time he makes it. And, and being in a, a college strength and conditioning program with a college dietitian. I mean, we were just talking about it. It changes players' bodies so much, even three years into college. So yeah, building some weapons. They picked up a six foot seven guy this morning as well. Um, and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. We'll, we'll have to like do like a, 
uh, what's the average height and weight of this class once it gets a little bit bit deeper and, and we know who we're working with. Yeah, Mike Waters, our friend from the basketball side of things on Syracuse.com, when we tweeted that, was like, oh, so they basically went and got uh, DJ Burns and, uh, and and put him out there from basketball. It's like, yeah, pretty much. That's what, mm-hmm. that's what they're getting here on the basketball side. So, Emily, speaking of new guys, I've been trying to focus on that the past couple of days. I'm going to do that a couple more times of practice this week. Here are two that stand out to me, and then I want to hear two that, that stand out to you, Okay. Emily knows this, so she's going to laugh when I say this. I'm a little obsessed with Yasin Willis, okay? I'm going to tell you right now. LaQuinn Allen is the number one running back on this team. LaQuinn Allen helped carry that team at the end of last year. He is the guy. He's going to be the starting running back on this team. But Yasin, Yasin Willis is playing, and he is going to push for time, and he is getting on that football field. 6'1", 215, He's already built, you just said it, Emily, these 17, 18-year-old guys that are coming in. He's already built like a senior. He pops on the field. I tweeted a video of him earlier. He just looks the part. And look, it's just drills that we're seeing right now. I haven't seen some real football. Jeff Nixon made a great point today that these freshmen have to get used to blocking and the things that they didn't have to do in high school. All that said, that guy's making a difference in that running back room. And look, Nixon was around Saquon Barkley with the Giants. And Willis, to me, as a champ, not saying he's Saquon Barkley, but he's going to be hard to tackle. And I feel like this is a guy we're going to see get on the field. He has really, really popped to me. So that's a name I'm going to continue to keep an eye on. The other one is... Can I go ahead on on Willis for a second? I was going to say, so as we were talking about, this was with Nixon, we we were talking about... um, Oh, no, this was with, with Fran he talked about Willis's development. This was kind of the first question I had asked him today was about Willis. And he said he came in around 212 pounds, which is the target weight they have for Allen. Um, And he is up to, I think you said 215, Fran said 225. It might be in between there. The roster isn't always 100% correct with, with weight. Right. And That's what like he's that. listed as. Yeah. So right. he could be, he could be bigger than that now. Right? He could yeah. be more, but what stood out to me is that like Fran pointed out he lost body fat and he still gained weight. Like they're, they're they're (laughs) leaking out these guys like, and, and put it on weight nonetheless, but it's, it's muscle weight, which is, which is obviously very different. (laughs) Jackson Meeks is the other guy, the transfer wide receiver, one of two from Georgia. And I know you had a chance to catch up with uh, the other uh, transfer wide receiver from Georgia, Zed Haynes. So we'll hear from him in a second. Jackson looks the part. He sounds the part, as you're going to hear in a second, as I play a couple sound bites from him. I think he's been a leader in that room. We've already heard his name mentioned by a bunch of people, the coaches, Kyle McCord, some other offensive players in the role that he's taking on. I really honed in on him today. And again, we're watching drills here, but he just looks like a guy that's been around and sounds like a guy that's been around. So let's listen to a couple things that uh, Jackson Meeks had to tell me today. First, on his quarterback, Kyle McCoy. Kyle's my guy. You know, he's a very poised person. I can't ever tell when he's joking or when he's serious, you know. And that's what you want in your quarterback. You want him calm under all situations. You want him calm when the pressure is at his highest. You want him calm when the pressure is at his lowest. You just want him to try to keep that mental head space. But you can also see that Kyle has a motor about him. He loves to win. And I love to win. Like, I hate losing. He hates losing. And I know that's what we bring together. You know, we watch film together. When we talk outside of football, you know, we just want the same things. We want to be able to achieve our goals to the best of our ability and do what we can to the best of our ability. This is Jackson Meeks, who won two national championships at Georgia, already establishing the connection with McCord, as you can hear. Uh, let's hear one more. From no, you. I have been. I was at the um, University of Georgia for three years, so I do have two national championships, so I've seen how it's supposed to be done. I've seen the standard that people are supposed to hold, our, hold ourselves to. And one of my old coach's uh, favorite sayings was, was a, um, a winning team is a player-led team. So... As players, we have to leave. We can't let the coaches always hold, try to hold us to the standard. As players, we got to hold each other to standards. So we have to be able to call out one of our brothers, one of our teammates, even if it might it might be our best friend. If they doing something that you know is wrong, if they doing something that they do, they're not doing their assignment right, we have to hold them to that standard. As players, we can't just let the coaches hold us hold us to hold us to the standard because they're not going to be on the field with us. Emily, who are two guys uh, or three that that have popped to you of the the new arrivals that still have those "Hello, my name is" tags on? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, you got to pair Haynes with Meeks there. We've heard about them pretty much in in tandem. Every time one gets brought up, the other gets brought up as well. We heard from from Fran, from McCord, from Aronde Gadsden, from Dan Valari about those guys. Um, you know, Haynes, though, is on the younger side. Um, I believe he's going to be a true sophomore this year. I might have that wrong. But he's he's on the younger side compared to Meeks's um, kind of veteran status. But, you know, these guys are going to be the type of one and two wide receivers, or if you if you want to group Aronde Gadsden in the wide receiver group, even though he remains the tight end, like the two and three that this team has lacked in previous years, and that I think has really stunted any passing offense it could have had, um, any aerial offense. There just hasn't been anyone consistent that they could go to and, and rely on every single time, and that that was something that Schrader talked about, just like not having that one guy, that chemistry that he had with Gadsden, especially once Gadsden was off the field next year. And and everything we've heard about both Zed Haynes and Jackson Meeks screams to me like these are guys that are going to be consistent. They're guys their QB is going to connect with, that McCord is going to connect with, and who are going to be consistent playmakers for this offense in a way I don't think we've seen in the wide receiver room. Um, you know, Meeks said, or on Meeks, Haynes said that the two of them were close um, and obviously are now both in positions where they can they can play a little bit more and, and make more opportunities to make plays. Um, but yeah, you know, it, Haynes is another one of those guys from from kind of the Jersey area. He's from Philadelphia, technically, but he mentioned that's what brought him up from Georgia following Coach Brown. Obviously, he didn't work with Coach Brown at Georgia because Brown was, with he was the working against He's Coach with the wide Brown receivers. He was yeah. working. He was working against him, in fact, but. He, he knew what Coach Brown, who Coach Brown was as a coach and what type of coach he was and had that connection back home. And, and that kind of lured him up here. So Haynes was Haynes is definitely one of those guys that I'm continuing to watch. He's fast. He's got good reaction speed. Someone on Twitter said they think he uh, he reminds them of Marvin Harrison, which mm. I, I've, I mean, I've obviously watched Marvin Harrison highlights, but I will trust some of my older peers on, on that comparison. Let's see about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see about that. that. That's a lofty standard to, to look right, at. Right, yeah. Um, and then my other one, this is just kind of a, a minor one, but we've been talking, theme of the episode has been size. And uh, one guy that I noticed during warmups today was was Noah Rosahack, one of the fresh true freshman O-linemen. Um, and I did look, he so when he first committed last last year, he was one of the commits that stuck around from the Dino era and and got the invite to stay in the class and and stick around with Fran. He was six five and about two seventy last year when he committed, and he's rostered at six six two eighty five now. So okay, he he caught my eye. That's that's a a big gain. And again, like he's still only eighteen. Like you put another six months of work in that guy, and he could be six seven and three hundred pounds by the end of the of fall camp. So. Those are my two for right now. Yeah. If you could take anything away from this podcast, these guys are eating their Wheaties for sure. <laughs> they are getting noticeably bigger and the players they've brought in look the part from schools like mm -hmm. Texas A&M and Georgia and these transfers. And I think we kind of saw that initially. You look at the measurables, you can go watch YouTube highlights, but to see them in person now, it, it really just strikes you. All right, Emily, we had a chance in the past couple of days to catch up with both coordinators Elijah Robinson on defense, Jeff Nixon on offense. Let's hear from uh, both of those gentlemen here. Let's go back to uh, Coach Robinson, who we caught up with on Saturday, and just kind of what he sees as his overall philosophy and what he's working on scheme. Well, I think that the, the number one thing is you have to know who your players are and what do they do well. You can't just come in here and lock these guys into a scheme and say we're playing this defense, this defense only. We got a really good staff and guys that come from all different backgrounds. So we're going to realize what our guys do well, and then we'll adjust from there. So the scheme is there is no scheme at this point. He's seen what he has. Most players we've talked to so far, Emily, say aggressive, attacking. They're obviously going to rely on that defensive front, as we've been talking about here, which is noticeably bigger out there. And I think that's music to people's ears. Not that there was anything wrong with the Tony White, then Rocky Long 3-3-5 philosophy. Sometimes knowing what you are and staying in a box can help. It, it can keep you focused, right? But... Robinson has fresh eyes, and I, I asked him the other day about, you know, Fidel Diggs has kind of been a leader for some guys out there showing the way, and Robinson's response to that was, well, he's got to learn too because there's going to be some new things in this defense that we weren't doing prior at Texas A&M. 
Right. And, you know, it just when you look at the defense as a whole and, and that idea that it's going to be this kind of fitting who you have as, as players, right? There's just so much diversity across the board. You got Diggs, but you also got King Joseph Edwards coming in. Obviously, those are kind of two guys at the opposite end spectrum, up opposite end of the spectrum of their college careers. Um, but both likely, I mean, Diggs will obviously get playing time. We're expecting King Joseph Edwards will likely get some too. Um, but I think what really emphasizes the fact that this is going to be a, a defense that adapts to its players and and works with what its players has have is just the fact that we've seen Brown moving people around where he he wants them in this defense, and and that's Deuce Chestnut. Like he moved him from cornerback to safety. And I have a quote. I asked about why he made this and let's made this move. And so Chestnut the other day had said, I think if I'm going to be back and forth. And, and Fran kind of, <laughs> Fran kind of shot that down. He said, I don't know about the back and forth that he likes to say. It makes him feel better. I want to see him play on Sunday. And he think he already showed that he can cover. So him going back there to do that, I think it gives him a great opportunity. Um, he compared him to Sean Chandler, who he coached at Temple and is, is in the NFL now. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything we're seeing like as vague as it, it seems to be like oh this is going to be like a player centric defense with we really emphasize their strengths like that sounds vague but like there's things backing that up that are showing us that no these are actual like legit tenants of of what this scheme is going to be and as much as there are a lot of new faces around this team uh robinson here talked about Justin Barron and Marlo Wax coming back and the role that they have played helping all these new guys act. Man, those guys, that's about JB and Marlo. They're great. It was great helping us uh, adjust when we first got here. Those guys hosted on official visits. Um, so those guys say they opened us, they opened their arms up to us as new, as a new staff and for the new players that came in. So I'm excited to have those guys that have those leaders. They made it easier for us. And again, those guys have been the first guys to come up to your office and say, hey, coach, what can we get better at? How can we help? So I'm excited to have those guys. And they were leaders before we got here, and they're darn sure leaders now. So this is a guy that has coached in the SEC, Emily. He's seen a lot of good quarterbacks that he's had a game plan against. How does Kyle McCord hold up with those He's names? the best I've been around. To be honest about that, you see the throws he make. He's going to challenge us every day. That's going to make us better for the game. So I'm glad that we get to go against them now instead of on Saturdays. That is Elijah Robinson, the new defensive coordinator for the Orange. To the offensive side of the ball we go, and we had a chance. Now, Emily and I uh, chatted with Jeff on this here podcast. So you can go back in the archives a little bit and listen to that full conversation. But here's what he said today, and we'll start with just what he's looking for on the offensive side. I think so. I think so. I think Gow is very, very intelligent, you know. Actually, let me start that over. This is, I asked Jeff about Kyle McCord and how in sync he is with Jeff on the offense and if McCord can kind of lead the way knowing what the offense He's done a nice job, like, outside of what we've asked him to do, just studying extra. You know, the kid works his butt off. He's a pro. Uh, uh, he approaches every day as if he is a uh, position coach, like he's a coach on the field. You know, he's always asking uh, great questions. He wants to know all the uh, little nuances of, of every – uh, every position on our offense, and he's doing a a, a great job, and uh, uh, he has a really good grasp of what we put in so far on our offense. One more from Jeff Nixon here. You alluded to this earlier, Emily, on, on the balance that he wants to see on, on the offensive attack. We want to be balanced. We want to be balanced. You know, we want to be able to, you know, at any point uh, during the season we play an opponent, if, if, you know, we have to throw it 50 times a game, we want to be able to do that. You know, we want to be able to protect the uh, cow and get our receivers in space and throw the ball downfield. If it's a game where we think, you know, we got to win up front, you know, it's a team that's struggling uh, in the run. We want to be able to run the football 50 times a game. So we want to have that balance uh, on, on offense. You know, the big thing is, you know, you win a lot of games uh, by holding on to the football, playing fundamentally sound, and then getting explosive plays in both the run and the pass game. So that's what we're, we're striving to do. And, and uh, like I said, we're just implementing the system, and uh, we'll see how it goes from week to week, you know, as far as uh, uh, if we can stay balanced or not. Coach, you have a nice mix. Emily, what were uh, some of your takeaways from getting to hear from Jeff Nixon today? Yeah, you know, I mean, again, like so much of what we talked about today with everyone was size and just all of that. But, I mean, Nixon talked a lot about the need for everyone on this team to be able to block uh, and to be able to block well. 
um one of the things one of the things he said was something like no block no rock meaning like, if you're not, if you're <laughs> not right. also if you're not also blocking you are sure as hell not getting the ball um and so like right like you think like oh well yeah of course you have to block in football but like one of the things we heard from Oronde Gadsden two seasons ago when he switched to tight end was like the blocking was the big thing that he needed to work on. One of the things we heard from Dan Valari when he switched to tight end, the blocking was one of the things he needed to work on. One of the things we heard from LaQuinn Allen today and Fran Brown about mm-hmm. bringing in some of the um, younger players and getting them adapted like Willis and then also Jaden Hart is that when you're a running back in high school, you're usually just carrying the football and that's all you do. But at the college level, you're asked to block and you have to do all these things to make sure you're successful. So that really stood out to me is just just the emphasis on that. We've seen in practice the tight ends going against the defensive linemen and, and working with the offensive linemen in a way we haven't really seen before. So I'm excited to talk with um, co-offensive coordinator and, and tight ends coach Michael Johnson here in the next couple days I don't remember exactly when we have him but hearing more a little bit more about rounding out that entire tight end group um and making sure all of them are kind of the type of type of guys who end up at the top of the blocking charts on PFF good uh opportunity here to hear from our Syracuse sports insiders and uh to become a Syracuse sports insider it couldn't be easier you just text the word orange to 315 847-3895. Try it free for two weeks. Just $3.99 a month after that, you get instant observations from Emily and I when we leave practice. Quotes that some of what you're not hearing or seeing on this podcast from our media sessions and the opportunity to talk to coaches and players and exclusive content, not only there, but of course, everything going on with basketball, lacrosse, and everything in the Syracuse sports world direct connection to me text me your thoughts your questions what you want emily and i to look for at practice by becoming a syracuse sports insider today matt d says a couple things are clear about fran's recruiting local and the highest upside players massive o linemen and track stars he believes he can take the raw tools and put them together adding time will tell that's true but the strategy is certainly exciting can't recruit all the five stars to syracuse now while uh, our six foot eight, three hundred eighty pound friend comes from Texas. Emily, a, a few of the other recruits we saw within that six hour window that they're trying to bring in, including, of course, New Jersey, which is becoming mm-hmm. the the home state of the orange, if you will. Right, and and one thing that I'll note on this podcast too, for those who are listening, is that like when we see guys that are unrated come in at this time of the year, it does not mean that they're going to stay unrated through the end of the recruiting period. Like by the time they actually sign, they could be a three or a four star or maybe even a five star. It's probably less likely they'd end up a five star. Usually by now five stars are on people's radars and they've seen them, but certainly they could they could gain a couple stars um once these recruiting services go out and and attend camps and talk to more coaches and just kind of widen the net. Like there are hundreds of thousands of players across the country and like they have to focus class by class on getting these ratings out. That said, like when we post about these recruits, we're always going to tell you whether they're, whether they're rated mm-hmm. or not right now, because I know you guys will ask. <laughs> and so just remember that, like, and that's, it's like all silly and it's all, it all feels like political, right. To be like, Oh, well, this kid's a three star versus a five star. And, and so many different players have different upsides, but um, all of this, all of this could change come signing day. We've seen kids drop stars as well. I mean, Jakari Williams was a four star by the the composite. I think when he v- very first committed and and ended up a three star by the end, and that's just because they see more quarterbacks, they adjust where people are. Different recruiting sites go by different um, variables and stuff like that. So we try to take the most um, aggregated it, number that reflects all of those. But doesn't mean there's any less reason to be excited about the recruiting, which I know everyone still is. Yeah, it's always great when you get a three or a four star. Syracuse saw an up- uptick in that. They're in the top 45 in the country right now in recruiting, which fluctuates on based on a number of things. You get bonus points, basically, the more players you have in a class. So keep right. that in mind. Willis was a highly rumored crime. Marcellus Barnes Jr., who's on this roster early, was a highly recruited guy. Then you have players that fit your need, guys that you find, especially in New Jersey, they come visit like they did this weekend. They like what they see. They like what they hear. And Washington, for example, had, especially after it went viral, picked up a lot of offers and a lot more attention in some big school. I mean, Texas, a Texas offensive lineman 
comes to Syracuse, New York in a snowstorm <laughs> and picks Syracuse, which tells you the connection he saw and made and was impressed by just by getting him here. Uh, today, uh, Jalen Prey, who's from uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, 6'7", 265. Yeah, right. so he may not be rated, but you can't teach size, right? <laughs> and the speed that's coming in there. So I think Matt makes a good observation there from our Syracuse Sports Insiders. TK says this, Emily. Pull it up here. Holy cow, Batman. This is the stuff of winners, no doubt. Great to hear the player's voice from the personal side, not only the game, practice recap of speed and athleticism. So he's impressed what he's hearing from these guys uh, thus far. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am happy to go to the bullpen and bring him in. He likes what he's seeing so far, too. Our guy, Rock and Ron. Hey, Brett, Rock and Ron in Florida. Just a shout out to you and our lady Emily. You got my ticker kicked up a notch the other day with your first podcast. However, it's a little early to jump in and start critiquing too much, but I'll tell you, I like that McCord has a good connection with Haynes, Meeks, and Aranda, and I'm sure Velari's in there too. Uh, Speaking of uh, them getting along, I saw an interview with Coach Brown the other day that I thought was really cool. They asked him how the new kids were getting along with uh, the kids that have been at at uh, Syracuse previous, and he says uh, he said he'd like to at this point compare them to uh, right now they're step brothers. They want to be full brothers by the end of. By the time the season starts, they'll be full brothers, he said. But right now, they're like stepbrothers, getting to know each other. So I'll be waiting to hear from your uh, uh, next podcast and uh, uh, see what's new up on the front so we can uh, get back together again. And you guys have a great one. We'll talk to you later. Bye. There he is, the legend, Rock and Ron. Right. Uh, Emily, I have to say this. This is a huge hole in my resume. I have not seen the movie Step Brothers. Oh, really? Yeah. I've seen the memes. I mean, I, I, I've i seen clips and, and all the memes and everything. Have you seen Step Brothers? So is this like a process here between, you know, what Will Ferrell and I'm forgetting the name of the other actor in that movie. I have to kind uh, of come John together. C. Riley. John, John C. Riley. John C. Riley. Thank you. Yes. Um. I have seen it. I'm going to be honest. I don't know that I've seen it all the way through. There are certain scenes that I can tell you I've like seen on cable TV, like random time. Like, you know, like yeah. when you turn a movie on and it always seems to it's be always the there. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I see, I see memes all the time. I feel like I've seen part of the movie just by that. Right. Um, but I, li I like the stepbrothers comparison. Hopefully they're not um, messing around with their bunk beds and in their dorm rooms. <laughs> I, they probably don't actually have to sleep in, in dorm rooms. I don't know what the dorm situation is for them, but uh, it, hopefully they're not stacking their beds on top of each other because that might that might cause some injuries and, and chaos that happens in that movie. So <laughs> I'll have to watch it at some point soon, just to kind of the, the, the gist of that. I never had stepbrothers. I did have stepsisters. And had to get used to that and had brothers-in-law that you mm. kind of have to get used to and get to know. So I kind of know what that process is like. Thank you, Rock and Ron. Always good to hear from you. Always great to hear from our Syracuse Sports Insiders as well. Keep your questions coming throughout spring practice, and Emily and I will do our very best to answer them for you. It's going to be a busy week. We've got two more practices to come and two more podcasts to come after those practices. So keep it locked here on Syracuse Sports. Make sure you subscribe and follow on Spotify, on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Becoming a Syracuse Sports Insider gets all those quotes and the sound and the information and the insight sent directly to your phone. Text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895 to become a Syracuse Sports Insider today. In the meantime, for Emily Liker, I'm Brent Dax. This has been Syracuse Sports presented by Krause Health, the exclusive health care partner for SU Athletics.